Leaf by Niggle is one of Tolkien's lesser-known works, but the philosophy that it presents is central to Tolkien's storytelling, creativity, and himself. It was written during the break between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and it really gives us a great insight into what was happening in his mind at the time, what it felt like to be an artist frantically creating for pretty much an audience of none. I'm Jess, part-time Hobbit, and today I'm going to tell you the story of Leaf by Niggle. If you haven't seen one of my storytime videos before, what I pretty much do is just read passages from this, as well as my own summary and my own thoughts. And yeah, we're just gonna talk through this delightful little story that Tolkien wrote. I apologize for the many, many noises that you're gonna be hearing in the background of this, because I thought it would be fun to have a change of scene without thinking about the logistics of that. There once was a little man called Niggle who had a long journey to make. He did not want to go, indeed the whole idea was distasteful to him, but he could not get out of it. So I'm gonna let you in on a little secret, a little spoiler here, but um, the character of Niggle is very representative of Tolkien. So the fact that this is how Niggle acts, it's very similar to how we see Bilbo and to some degree Frodo also acting when it comes to this long journey that they're going to have to make. So perhaps we can begin to draw some parallels between Tolkien and the protagonists that he wrote, especially the Hobbits. Niggle was a painter, not a very successful one, partly because he had many other things to do. I get that. Most of these things he thought were a nuisance, but he did them fairly well when he couldn't get out of them, which in his opinion was far too often. There were other hindrances to his art, too. For one thing, he was sometimes just idle and did nothing at all. For another, he was kind-hearted in a way. You know the sort of kind heart. It made him uncomfortable more often than it made him do anything. And even when he did anything, it didn't prevent him from grumbling, losing his temper, and swearing, mostly to himself. All the same, it did land him in many good jobs for his neighbor, Mr. Parrish, a man with a lame leg. Also, now and again, he remembered his journey and began to pack a few things in an ineffectual way. At such times, he didn't paint very much. So we are beautifully building out this character who is the artist who doesn't have time for his art, which I think if you are an artist, you probably, you can probably relate to this, I think. Nickel had a number of pictures on hand. Most of them were too large and ambitious for his skill. He was the sort of painter who could paint leaves better than trees. He used to spend a long time on a single leaf, trying to catch its shape, its sheen, and the glistening of dewdrops on its edges. Yet, he wanted to paint a whole tree, with all of its leaves in the same style, and all of them different. I see this as a kind of, um, not quite perfectionism, but certainly it's building out this character of someone who is so obsessed with the details that they're oftentimes unable to ever complete the larger picture. There was one picture in particular which bothered him. It had begun with a leaf caught in the wind, and it became a tree. And the tree grew, sending out innumerable branches and thrusting out the most fantastic roots. Strange birds came and settled on the twigs and had to be attended to. Then all around the tree and behind it, through the gaps, the leaves and boughs, a country began to open out and there were glimpses of a forest marching over the land and of mountains tipped with snow. Niggle lost interest in all his other pictures, or else he took them and tacked them onto the edges of the great picture. Soon the canvas became so large that he had to get a ladder, and he ran up and down it, putting a touch here and, and rubbing out a patch there. When people came to call, he seemed polite enough, though he fiddled a little with the pencils on his desk. He listened to what they said, but underneath, he was thinking all the time about his big canvas and the tall shed which had been built for it out in his garden. So Niggle has his masterpiece that he's been working on. What need have we for a helicopter, I ask ye? So Niggle wishes most, most dearly that he could ignore other people when they come to call on him, but he knows he can't, but that's okay, because at the very least, he's going to finish this great picture before he's called to the journey. That's what he tells himself, but it also says, yet he was beginning to see that he could not put off his start indefinitely. The picture would have to stop just growing and get finished. Certainly, again, something that many artists will be able to relate to. One day, Niggle stood a little way off from his picture and considered it with unusual attention and attachment. He couldn't make up his mind what he thought about it and wished he had some friend to tell him what to think. 
Actually, it seemed to him wholly unsatisfactory, and yet very lovely. The only really beautiful picture in the world. What he would have liked at that moment would have been to see himself walk in, slap him on the back and say, with obvious sincerity, absolutely magnificent, I see what you're getting at. Do get on with it and don't bother about anything else. We'll arrange for a public pension so that you need not. However, there was no public pension or else Nigel would have been truly living the artist's dream, just getting to create without having to worry about responsibilities and stuff. So Nigel decides to try and buckle down and really get this painting finished, but things keep coming up. People fall ill, his neighbor Mr. Parrish has a lame leg, and then it's springtime, so people are constantly coming by to his little countryside house to take tea with him. And with all the work he's putting into the painting, his garden is becoming neglected, which is a big problem because in this area there's a very strict homeowners association, and so the inspector is going to come by and tell him that his garden is unsatisfactory unless he's able to put some work in on that. But at the same time, everyone knows that he has this journey coming up and they're all speculating on what's going to happen once he has to leave for this journey. You know, who's gonna get his garden? Who's gonna get his house? How are they gonna divide up his possessions? once he's gone. The autumn came very wet and windy. The little painter was in his shed. He was up on the ladder, trying to catch the gleam of the westering sun on the peak of a snow mountain, which he had glimpsed just to the left of the leafy tip of one of the tree's branches. He knew that he would have to be leaving soon, perhaps early next year. He could only just get the picture finished, and only so at that. There were some corners which he would not have time to do more than a hint at what he had wanted. There was a knock on the door. Come in, he said sharply, and climbed down the ladder. It was his neighbor, Mr. Parrish. Mr. Parrish is his only neighbor, since everyone lives very far off. Still, he didn't like the man very much, partly because he was so often in trouble and in need of help, and also because he didn't care about painting and was very critical about gardening. And Mr. Parrish hates uh, Niggle's garden, where it's, it's gotten so wild. Well, Parrish, what is it? said Niggle. I oughtn't interrupt you, I know, said Parrish, without a glance at the picture. You're very busy, I'm sure. Nigel had meant to say something like that himself, but he had missed his chance. All he said was, yes. But I have no one else to turn to, said Parrish. Quite so, said Nigel with a sigh, one of those sighs that are a private comment, but which are not made quite inaudible. What can I do for you? My wife has been ill for some days, and I'm getting worried, said Parrish, and the wind has blown half the tiles off my roof, and the water is pouring into the bedroom. I think I ought to get the doctor. And the builders, too, only they take so long to come. And I was just wondering if you had any wood and canvas you could spare, just to patch me up and, and see me through for a day or two. Now he did look at the painting. Dear, dear, said Nagel, you are unlucky. I hope it's no more than a cold your wife's got. I'll come round presently and help you move the patient downstairs. Thank you very much, Pear said rather coolly. But it is a cold, not a fever. I should not have bothered you for a cold, and my wife is in bed downstairs already. I can't get up and down with trays, not with my leg. But I see you are rather busy. Sorry to have troubled you. I'd rather hoped you might have been able to spare time to go for the doctor, seeing how I'm placed, and the builder too, if you really have no canvas you can spare. It is so, so easy to resent Mr. Parrish. Uh, Tolkien knows how to write an antagonist. Of course, said Nigel. I could go. I'll, I'll go if you really are worried. I am worried, very worried. I wish I wasn't lame, said Parrish. But Nigel knows that Mr. Parrish truly does have a lame leg and that he doesn't have a bicycle like Nigel has. So despite the fact that he does need to work on his painting, he decides to ride into town to get some help. The builder's not in, so he leaves him a note and he calls for the doctor who refuses to come until the next day. And then Nigel goes home and discovers that he's starting to feel a bit sick himself. Nigel remained in bed for some time. The wind went on blowing. It took away a good many more of Parrish's tiles and some of Nigel's as well. His own roof began to leak. The builder did not come. Nigel didn't care for a day or two, and then he crawled out to look for some food. Parrish didn't come round. The rain had got to his leg and made it ache, and his wife was busy mopping up the water and wondering if that Mr. Nigel had forgotten to call at the builder's. Had she seen any chance of borrowing anything useful, she would have sent Parrish round, leg or no leg, but she didn't so Nigel was left to himself. At the end of the week or so, Nigel tottered out to his shed again. He tried to climb the ladder, but it made his head giddy. He sat and looked at the picture, but there were no patterns of leaves or visions of mountains in his mind that day. He could have painted a far-off view of a sandy desert, but he had not the energy. I have been on and off sick for like the last two weeks, effectively, with a flu and then some 
fallout things from the flu and um, as an artist, as a, as a creator, it, it's very hard because giving myself that time to recover when all I want to do is get back to work and get back to creating, it, it's, it's very tough. So um, yeah, I mean, obviously everyone gets sad when they're sick and everyone has a hard time when they're sick, but I think particularly artists, it's very hard being taken away from the, the thing that, you know, makes you happy because of your sickness, so. I certainly feel for him. Next day, he felt a good deal better. He climbed the ladder and began to paint. He had just begun to get into it again when there came a knock on the door. Damn, said Nagel, but he might just as well have said, come in politely, for the door opened all the same. This time, a very tall man came in, a total stranger. This is a private studio, said Nagel. I am busy, go away. I am an inspector of houses, said the man, holding up his appointment card, so Nagel on his ladder could see it. Oh, he said. Your neighbor's house is not satisfactory at all, said the inspector. I know, said Nagel. I, I took a note to the builders a long time ago, but they've never come, and then I've been ill. I see, said the inspector. But you are not ill now. It's so frustrating, because it takes so long to recover from an illness, and please just let this poor man do his art. But I'm not a builder, Nagel said. Parrish ought to make a complaint to the town council and get help from the emergency service. They're busy with worse damage than any up here, said the inspector. There's been a flood in the valley, and many families are homeless. You should have helped your neighbor make temporary repairs and prevent the damage from getting more costly to men than necessary. That is the law. There's plenty of material here. Canvas, wood, and waterproof paint. Where? said Nagel indignantly. There, said the inspector, pointing to the picture. My picture, exclaimed Nagel. I dare say it is, said the inspector. But houses come first. It's the law. Although he doesn't dive super into it here, we can kind of see this internal conflict that Tolkien has between practical work, you know, the work that makes money, the work that builds and maintains houses, and creative work and that that's a very hard balance to strike because obviously one of those things is very immediately needed for survival but in a way i think that creativity is also needed for survival so that's a that's a very hard balance to strike but i, I can't nickel said no more for at that moment another man came in very much like the inspector he was almost his double tall dressed in all black come along he said I am the driver. Nagel stumbled down from his ladder. His fever seemed to have come on again and his head was swimming. He felt cold all over. Driver, he chattered. Dr driver, driver of what? You and your carriage, said the man. The carriage was ordered long ago. It has come at last. It's waiting. You start on your journey, you know. There now, said the inspector. You'll have to go. But it's a bad way to start your journey, leaving your jobs undone. Still, we can at least make use of this canvas now. Oh dear, said poor Niggle, beginning to weep, and it, it's not, not even finished. Not finished, said the driver. Well, it's finished with, as far as you're concerned, at any rate. Come along. Niggle went, quite quietly. The driver gave him no time to pack, saying that he ought have done that before, and that they would miss the train. So all Niggle could do was grab a little bag in the hall. He found that it only contained a, a paint box, a small book of his own sketches, neither food nor clothes. They caught the train all right. Nigel was feeling very tired and sleepy. He was hardly aware of what was going on when they bundled him into his compartment. He didn't care much. He had forgotten where he was supposed to be going or what he was going for. The train ran almost at once into a dark tunnel. He arrives at the station to find a porter calling his name and he's so flustered to run off to the porter that he forgets even the little bag that he had on the train. Ah, there you are, said the porter, this way. What, no luggage? You'll have to go to the workhouse. Niggle felt very ill and fainted on the platform. They put him on an ambulance and took him to the workhouse infirmary. He didn't like the treatment at all. The medicine they gave him was bitter. The officials and attendants were unfriendly, silent, and strict, and he never saw anyone else except a very severe doctor who visited him occasionally. It was more like being in a prison than in a hospital. Well, it's, it is a workhouse, my friend. So Nigel is deeply upset by the fact that he has to do hard manual labor, you know, uh, digging and carpentry, and he's never allowed outside, all the windows lock inwards, and they're leaving him in the dark for long, long periods of time. It's simply cruel and unusual, especially for an artist like him. So in all this time, he starts to think about the past and what he could have done differently. He thinks, I wish I'd called on Parrish the first morning after the high winds began. 
I meant to. The first loose tiles would have been easy to fix. Then Mrs. Parrish might not have caught that cold. Then I shouldn't have caught my cold either. Then I should have had a week longer. But in time, he forgot what it was that he had wanted a week longer for. And if he worried at all after that, it was about his jobs in the hospital. Niggle is beginning to forget his art. At any rate, poor Niggle got no pleasure out of life. Not what he had been used to call pleasure. He was certainly not amused. But it could not be denied that he began to have a feeling of, well, satisfaction. Bread rather than jam. He could take up a task for the moment one bell rang and lay it aside promptly the moment the next one went, all tidy and ready to be continued at the right time. He had no time of his own and he was beginning to become a master of his time. He began to know just what he could do with it. There was no sense of rush. He was quieter inside now and at resting time, he could really rest. So basically, Nigel here is now on that alpha grind set. And as someone who, who does a lot of creative work and also struggles with kind of self-management and self-organization, as many of us with like, you know, focus issues and stuff struggle with, I, I think this is a very interesting passage because it shows how, how this whole like grinding at your work and never having any time to think about anything else, sometimes it can feel really nice and it can feel really like safe. And obviously Tolkien wouldn't argue against creators being able to create, so let's continue with the story. Then suddenly they changed all his hours. They hardly let him go to bed at all. They took him off carpentry altogether and kept him at plain digging day after day. He took it fairly well. It was a long while before he began to grope in the back of his mind for the curses that he had practically forgotten. He went on digging till his back seemed broken, his hands were raw, and he felt that he couldn't manage another spadeful. Nobody thanked him, but the doctor came and looked at him. Knock off, he said, complete rest in the dark. So maybe that is Tolkien's answer to this um, working hard, kind of makes your brain go quiet, makes you more organized, but it also makes you prone to be overworked by the system that's working you and to, to be abused in that way. As he's resting in the dark, uh, he hears some voices. Now, the niggle case, said a voice, a severe voice, more severe than the doctor's. What's the matter with him? Said a second voice, a voice you might have called gentle, though it was not soft. It was a voice of authority and it sounded at once hopeful and sad. What was the matter with niggle? His heart was in the right place. Yes, but it didn't function properly, said the first voice, and his head was not screwed on tight enough. He hardly ever thought at all. Look at the time he wasted, not even amusing himself. He never got ready for his journey. He was moderately well off, and yet he arrived here almost destitute and had to be put in the pauper's wing. A bad case, I'm afraid. I think he should stay some time yet. It would not do him any harm, perhaps, said the second voice. But of course, he's only a very little man. He was never meant to be anything much, and he was never very strong. Damn, these are brutal voices. <laughs> Let us look at the records. Yes, there are some favorable points, you know. Perhaps, said the first voice, but very few that will really bear examination. Well, said the second voice, there are these. He was a painter, by nature. In a minor way, of course. Still, a leaf by Nigel has a charm of its own. He took a great deal of pains with leaves just for their own sake, but he never thought that made him important. There's no note in the records of him pretending even to himself that it excused his neglect of things ordered by the law. Then he shouldn't have neglected so many, said the first voice. All the same, he did answer a good many calls. A small percentage, the other voice says, mostly of the easier sort, and he called those interruptions. The records are full of the word, together with a lot of complaints and silly imprecations. True, but they looked like interruptions to him, of course, poor little man. And there's this, he never expected any return, as so many of his sort call it. There's the parish case, the one that came in later. He was Nigel's neighbor and never did a stroke for him, and seldom showed any gratitude at all. But there's no note in the records that Nigel expected Parrish's gratitude. He doesn't seem to have thought about it. Yes, that is a point, said the first voice, but it's rather small. I think you'll find Nigel often merely forgot. Things he had to do for Parrish, he put out of his mind as a nuisance he had done with. Still, there's this last report, said the second voice, that wet bicycle ride. I rather lay stress on that. It seems plain that that was a genuine sacrifice. 
Nigel guessed that he was throwing away his last chance with his picture, and he guessed too that Parrish was worrying unnecessarily. I think you put it too strongly, said the first voice, but you have the last word. It is your task, of course, to put the best interpretation of the facts. Sometimes they will bear it. What do you propose? I think it is a case for a little gentle treatment now, said the second voice. Nigel thought that he had never heard anything so generous as that voice. It made gentle treatment sound like a load of rich gifts and the summons to a king's feast. Then, suddenly, Nigel felt ashamed. To hear that he was considered a case for gentle treatment overwhelmed him and made him blush in the dark. It was like being publicly praised when you and all the audience knew the praise was not deserved. Nigel hid his blushes in a rough blanket. There was a silence, then the first voice spoke to Nigel quite close. You've been listening, it said. Yes, said Nigel. Well, what have you to say? Could you tell me about Parrish, said Nigel. I should like to see him again. I hope he's not very ill. Can you cure his leg? It used to give him a wretched time. And please don't worry about him and me. He was a very good neighbor and let me have excellent potatoes very cheap, which saved me a lot of time. Did he? said the first voice. I'm glad to hear it. There was another silence. Nigel heard the voices receding. Well, I agree, he heard the first voice say in the distance. Let him go on to the next stage, tomorrow, if you like. So the next day he wakes up and he boards a train. The train moved off at once. Nigel lay back in his seat. The little engine puffed along in a deep cutting with high green banks roofed with a blue sky. It didn't seem very long before the engines gave a whistle, and the brakes were put on, and the train stopped. There was no station, no signboard, only a flight of steps up the green embankment. At the top of the steps, there was a wicket gate in a trim hedge. By the gate stood his bicycle, at least it looked like his, and there was a yellow label tied to the bars with Niggle written on it in large black letters. Niggle pushed open the gate, jumped on the bicycle, and went bowling downhill into the spring sunshine. Before long, he'd found that the path on which he had started had disappeared, and the bicycle was rolling along a marvelous turf. It was green and close, and yet he could see every blade distinctly. He seemed to remember having seen or, or dreamed that sweep of grass, somewhere or other. The curves of the land were familiar, somehow. Yes, the ground was becoming level, as it should, and now, of course, it was beginning to rise again. A great green shadow came up between him and the sun. Nigel looked up and fell off his bicycle. Before him stood the tree. His tree. Finished. If you could say that of a tree that was alive, its leaves opening, its branches growing and bending in the wind that Nigel had so often felt or guessed and had so often failed to catch. He gazed at the tree, and slowly he lifted his arms and opened them wide. It's a gift, he said. He was referring to his art and also to the result, but he was using the word quite literally. He went on looking at the tree. All the leaves he had ever labored were there as he imagined them rather than as he had made them. And there were others that had only budded in his mind and many that might have budded if only he had the time. And it's not just the tree that's finished, but everything the birds on the tree, the landscape that he had painted behind it, it's all there, yet more perfectly than he ever could have imagined through his art. Nigel walked about, but he was not merely pottering. He was looking around carefully. Nothing needed altered any longer. Nothing was wrong as far as it had gone, but it needed continuing up to a definite point. Nigel saw the point precisely in each case. He sat down under a very beautiful distant tree, a variation of the great tree, but quite individual, or it would be with a little more attention. And he considered where to begin work, and where to end it, and how much time was required. He couldn't quite work out his scheme. Of course, he said, what I need is perish. There's lots of things about earth, plants, and trees that he knows and I don't. This place cannot be left just as a private park. I need help and assistance. I ought to have got it sooner. He got up and walked to the place where he had decided to begin work. He took off his coat. Then down in a little sheltered hollow hidden from view, he saw a man looking around rather bewildered. He was leaning on a spade, but plainly didn't know what to do. Nigel hailed him. Parrish, he said. Parrish shouldered the spade and came up to him. He still limped a little. They did not speak, just nodded as they used to do, passing in the lane. But now they walked about together, arm in arm. Without talking, Nigel and Parrish agreed exactly where to make the small house and garden which seemed to be required. 
So now, somehow, in Niggle's little paradise, his gift, Mr. Parrish, has appeared because he's realized that his art is nothing without the hard practicality of Mr. Parrish. So they work together with Niggle at the head of organizing everything since he had his time to learn how to work and how to organize in the workhouse. And one day Parrish is laying in the sun and he says, this is grand, he said. I oughtn't to be here, really. Thank you for putting in a word for me. Nonsense, said Niggle. I, I don't remember what I said, but anyways, it wasn't nearly enough. Oh, yes, it was, said Parrish. It got me out a lot sooner. That second voice, you know, he'd sent me here. And he said, you asked to see me. I owe it to you. No, you owe it to the second voice, said Niggle. We both do. So they keep working together, even if they are a few disagreements, and, and everything in this paradise is coming together beautifully. As their work drew to an end, they allowed themselves more and more time for walking about, looking at the trees and flowers and the lights and shapes and the lie of the land. Sometimes they sang together, but Niggle found that he was beginning to turn his eyes more and more often towards the mountains. The time came when the house in the hollow, the garden, the grass, the forest, the lake, and all the country was nearly complete in its own proper fashion. The great tree was in full blossom. We shall finish this evening, said Parrish one day. After that, we'll go for a really long walk. They set out the next day, and they walked until they came right through the distances to the edge. It was not visible, of course. There is no line or fence or wall, but they knew they had come to the margin of that country. They saw a man. He looked like a shepherd, and he was walking towards them down the grass slopes that led into the mountains. Do you want a guide? he asked. Do you want to go on? For a moment, a shadow fell between Niggle and Parrish. For Niggle knew that he did now want to go on, and in a sense, ought to go on. But Parrish did not want to go on, and was not ready to go. I must wait for my wife, said Parrish to Niggle. She'd be lonely. I rather gathered that they would send her after me sometime or other when she was ready and when I had got things ready for her. The house is finished now, as well as we could make it, but I should like to show it to her. She'll be able to make it better, I expect, more homely. I hope she'll like this country, too. He turned to the shepherd. Are you a guide? He asked. Could you tell me the name of this country? Don't you know, said the man. It is Niggle's country. It is Niggle's picture, or most of it. A little of it is now Parrish's garden. Niggle's picture, said Parrish in astonishment. Did you think of all this? I never thought you were so clever. Why didn't you tell me? He tried to tell you long ago, said the man, but you wouldn't look. He'd only got canvas and paint in those days, and you wanted to mend your roof with them. This is what you and your wife used to call Niggle's nonsense or that daubing. But it didn't look like this then. Not real, said Parrish. No. It was only a glimpse then, said the man. But you might have caught the glimpse if you had ever thought it worth a while to try. I didn't give you much chance, said Niggle. I never tried to explain. I used to call you the old earth grubber. But what does it matter? We've lived and worked together now. Things might have been different, but they could not have been better. All the same, I'm afraid I shall have to be going on. We shall meet again, I expect. There must be many more things we can do together. Goodbye. He shook Parrish's hand warmly, a good, firm, honest hand, it seemed. He turned and looked back for a moment. The blossom on the great tree was shining like flame. All the birds were flying in the air and singing. Then he smiled and nodded to Parrish and went off with his shepherd. So that's the end of Niggle, but it is not quite the end of this story. So now this takes us out of Niggle's little paradise and back into the real world. I think he was a silly little man, said Counselor Tompkins. Worthless, in fact, no use to society at all. Oh, I don't know, said Atkins, who was nobody of importance, just a schoolmaster. I'm not so sure. It depends on what you mean by use. No practical or economic use, said Tompkins. I dare say he could have been made into a serviceable cog of some sort if you schoolmasters know your business. But you don't, and so we get useless people of his sort. I should have put him away long ago. Put him away? You mean you'd have made him start on the journey before his time? Yes, if you must use that meaningless old expression. Push him through the tunnel into the great rubbish heap. That's what I mean. Then you don't think painting is worth anything? Not worth preserving or improving or even making use of? 
Of course painting has uses, said Tompkins, but you couldn't make use of his painting. There's plenty of scope for bold young men not afraid of new ideas and new methods. None for this old-fashioned stuff. Private daydreaming. He could not have designed a telling poster to save his life, always fiddling with leaves and flowers. I asked him why once. He said he thought they were pretty. Can you believe it? He said pretty. D what, digestive and genital organs of plants? I said to him, and he had nothing to answer. Silly footler. Footler, sighed Atkins. Yes, poor man, he may never have finished anything. Ah well, his canvases have been put to better uses since he went. And I am not sure, Tompkins. You remember the large one? The one they used to patch the damaged house next door of his after the gales and floods? I found a corner of it, torn off, lying in a field. It was damaged but legible. A mountain peak and a spray of leaves. I can't get it out of my mind. Out of your what? said Tompkins. What are you two talking about? said Perkins, intervening the cause of peace. Atkins had flushed rather red. The name's not worth repeating, said Tompkins. I don't know why we're talking about him at all. He didn't live in town. No, said Atkins, but you had your eye on his house all the same. That's why you used to go and call and sneer at him while drinking his tea. Well, now you've got his house now, as well as the one in town, so you need not grudge his name. We were talking about Niggle, if you want to know, Perkins. Oh, poor little Niggle, said Perkins. Never knew he painted. That was probably the last time Niggle's name ever came up in conversation. However, Atkins preserved that odd corner. Most of it crumbled, but one beautiful leaf remained intact. Atkins had it framed. Later, he left it to the town museum, and for a long while, Leaf by Niggle hung there in a recess and was noticed by a few eyes. But eventually the museum was burnt down and the Leaf and Niggle were entirely forgotten in his old country. It is proving very useful indeed, said the second voice, as a holiday and, and as a refreshment. It's splendid for convalescence, and not only for that. For many, it is the best introduction to the mountains. It works wonders in some cases. I'm sending more and more there. They seldom have to come back. No, is that so? said the first voice. I think we should have to give the region a name. What do you propose? The porter settled that some time ago, said the second voice. Train for Niggles Parish in the Bay, he had shouted for a long while now. Niggles Parish. I sent a message to both of them to tell them. What did they say? They both laughed. Laughed. The mountains rang with it. So that was Leaf by Niggle. I, I think it's interesting because it's one of the more allegorical of Tolkien's story. And of course we do have the quote from Tolkien saying that he despises allegory in all of its forms, which diving into that is gonna be a full video at some point, I'm sure, because Yes, he said that he hated allegory in all of its forms, but my personal opinion is that he meant more like specific and direct allegory, kind of like we see in Narnia, where there's not really any way to interpret it other than saying that the lion is Jesus. That's a simplification. Uh, Narnia is much deeper than that, but like basically that direct kind of one-to-one -one allegory, Tolkien wasn't really comfortable with. That's why you can make an argument that most of the characters in The Lord of the Rings are representative or kind of allegorical for a Christ figure. He preferred something that was much more nuanced and multifaceted rather than it being a one-to-one -one allegory. So in the same way, I don't think that Leaf by Niggle is a specific one-to-one -one allegory, but still, I think the clearest kind of interpretation of this is to say that Niggle is an artist who dies and the workhouse is a kind of um, specifically Catholic idea of purgatory, where it's this period between life and heaven where you are purified from your sins for a time before you are able to be made pure enough for heaven. And that uh, Niggles Parish, as it's come to be known, is his heaven. And so for Tolkien to think that the creator, specifically the, the sub-creator, one who makes sub-worlds inside our worlds, that their version of heaven would be seeing their world, their creation, realized, I just, I, I just, I, I think that's stunningly beautiful imagery. So, and I think this is especially interesting because it came out uh, before The Lord of the Rings was out. Hello? And so, effectively, before Tolkien blew up, before he, he got worldwide notoriety, that came, you know, years, I think 
think potentially decades after he wrote this story. And so for Nigel, who is, I believe, a representation of Tolkien in some ways, the, the, the archetypical artist, for him to be pretty much unknown and not respected by the community at large speaks very well to how Tolkien must have been feeling at this time. To pour his entire life's work and to put all of this effort into something that effectively nobody was going to read and yet even without all of the notoriety that he was going to get from the Lord of the Rings, even without all of the popularity, all of the fame that he was eventually going to gain, we know because of this piece that he would have been happy with that. He would have been happy being unknown and yet creative and of course he would have complicated feelings towards it but I think this story is proof that he would have been happy. I recommend that anybody who's a Tolkien fan, especially if you are an artist or an author or a creator of any sort, that you really give this a full read and meditate on it a bit because it is one of the most heartwarming and comforting stories that, um, that I've ever read. So it, it really, it means a lot to me. And I'm really glad that I could share this with you guys today. The sun's been going in and out from behind clouds, so I hope the lighting wasn't too obnoxious, but I thought it would be nice to take you guys out on a little outing today. So here we are. If this is your first time hearing the story, I would love to know what you got out of it. If it sparked any, any thoughts about the creative process, you know, let me know that. And if you have read it before, I would love to hear about how you found it and what your first time reading it was like. So yeah, uh, comment below because I really, really enjoy chatting with you guys. And if you did enjoy this video, be sure to hit that like button because it really helps me out in the algorithm and hit the subscribe button if you want to join me every week and the notification bell so that you don't miss a single time that I upload. Thank you all so much for watching and I hope that you all have a very happy hobbity day.